we are grateful for this medium, for this technology that the Lord has provided to us. Now, if you didn't know already, there's some great Karis Kids resources for you to utilize during this time. Um, you can find them on our COVID-19 landing page on our website. Um, each week there, there's a video that's posted from one of our awesome Karis Kids volunteers. There are songs there. There's all kinds of resources. Um, Sarah Pierce has done a great job of putting that together. So use those if you'd like, if those would benefit you. I also want to remind you that we are meeting weekly, as always, um, electronically, of course, in our 16 small groups, um, what we call missional communities in Karis. Um, as we are social distancing, and we must, we must also keep connecting. We have to. So email me at kevin at karischurch.org if you want to be involved in one of those, or go to our website, karischurch.org, click on the missional communities um, tab, and you can learn a lot more about those. People will be ready to welcome you into those groups even, even now. Now, there are a couple of really important ways that I think we can serve our community, that we really need to serve our community during this time. First of all, there are many around us and among us with, with needs, with spiritual needs, with material needs. Pastor Rob has put together a crisis relief team of Karis family members who can help. So email him, rob at karischurch.org, if you have a need or if you know someone who does have a need. In addition, um, he needs 20 volunteers for this Wednesday, and you'd serve from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. to help with this mobile food bank that, that we're helping put on um, with the Central Missouri um, Food Bank over at the Boone ha County Health Department. So email him ASAP if you can help or contact him on Facebook, Rob Gaskin. It's rob at karischurch.org again. Now, secondly, um, I'm really excited about um, the way that we're seeking to help healthcare workers during this time. Um, they're putting their lives at risk. They're really on the front lines for us and for our loved ones. I'm, I'm excited about what we've been able to accomplish um, so far. We've probably got um, at least 20 um, nurses that are sponsored um, by someone in Karis, but we um, are not going to have too many nurses. Um, we need more people to sign up. Um, we're trying to target, at least start with the people that are serving on the front lines in the COVID-19 units at University Hospital. And so sign up, go to our website, karischurch.org, to find out more. Um, Carly Ogan is helping out and doing a great job with that. Um, but let's just seek to bless um, those that are serving us so well during this time. Well, in a second, I'm going to transition over to Katie Beshek, and she's going to lead us in worship through song. But first, um, I want to give you just a brief word of encouragement. Uh, this week, a friend of mine uh, posted a list of coronavirus guidelines on Facebook, and I think they expressed so well the confusion that so many of us feel as we try to understand what's going on us around us right now. Um, among those guidelines were things like this. Um, you should not go to hospitals unless you have to go there. Same applies to doctors. You should only go there in case of emergency, provided you are not too sick. You will have many symptoms when you're sick, but you can also get sick without symptoms, have symptoms without being sick, or be contagious without be having symptoms. This virus is deadly, but still not too scary, except that sometimes it actually leads to a global disaster. You can get restaurant food delivered to the house, which may have been prepared by people who didn't wear masks or gloves, but you have to have your groceries de decontaminated outside for three hours. The virus has no effect on children except those it affects. Everyone needs to stay home, but it's important to go out. Basically, you can't leave the house for any reason, but if you have to, you can. We have no treatment except there may be one that apparently is not dangerous unless you take too much, which is the case with all medications. And... The list goes on, and it illustrates, I think, how so many of us are feeling or have been feeling, a torn, tossed, back and forth, up and down, what's true, what's false, who's right, who's wrong, are we all going to die, or is everything going to be back to normal next week? Well, it makes me think of Paul's words in, Philipp in Ephesians chapter 4. Started in verse 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11 to 16. 16. And, and he gave, he gave the apostles, the, apostles, the prophets, the, prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the shepherds, and, shepherds and, teachers and teachers to equip, to equip the saints, saints for the work of the 
of Christ. We all attain, we all attain to the unity, unity, of, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, and knowledge of, God, of God to mature manhood, mature manhood to the measure, to measure of stature of, of Christ, of Christ so, so that we may no longer, no longer be children tossed to and fro and waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human by cunning, by craftiness, evil schemes. Rather, speaking the truth and love, we are to grow up every way to him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, whole body joined, joined held together, held together by every, by every joint, joint with, with which it is equipped. When each when part, each is part working, is working properly, properly makes the body, makes the grow, body grow so that it builds, so that it builds itself, up, itself in up in love. Paul here talks of being tossed to and fro by the waves and be being cared about by every wind. And again, I think that describes what many of us have been experiencing or feeling. But he also tells us right there how to fight against it, right? Um, we grow up in Christ we seek to know him better. We live life in the body, in the church. So we pursue unity there. It all sounds pretty basic, but it's, of course, so easy for us to forget. Paul says that the pastors like me are called to equip you to do those things, to remind you to pursue those things. Because, of course, in times like these, it's so easy to distract ourselves. It's so easy to numb ourselves. It's so easy to go anywhere but where the Lord tells us to go here. But church, if we don't want to find ourselves thrown around and constantly up and down emotionally, spiritually, if we want to be established, if we want to be stable, if we want to be safe in these turbulent times, we have to heed, we have to listen to these words. The straightforward Sunday school answers, read your Bible, spend time in prayer, depend on your church family, encourage those around you, trust in Jesus. Those are all the right answers, right? They're, they're pretty simple. They're very straightforward. But that, of course, doesn't mean it's not hard. In fact, really hard. So let's encourage one another in the coming weeks in these truths all the time, but especially now. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to turn it over to Katie, who, again, is going to lead us in, in song. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that your word wasn't written to people that were in calm, easy times, but, but people that were suffering persecution, that were suffering sickness and death, just the kind of things um, that we're maybe starting to experience for the first time in a while, at least in America, Father. Um, that gives us comfort, Lord. Allow those truths to just speak into our stubborn hearts. Uh, to remind us, Lord, that the only pathway um, toward um, health and growth is just being rooted in you, being established in your people, Lord. Um, keep us by your grace from turning to things that don't help, that don't satisfy, Lord. Um, draw us together in unity around you during this time, and may that honor you, Lord. We praise you and thank you, Lord. We ask you to work, um, even as we're in our separate homes today, even though that we're looking across the screen today, Lord, we know that um, that isn't the ideal, but we know that it's not um, something that um, you didn't expect or you can't handle. We know it's something, in fact, that you can use in great ways, and we ask you to do that, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to read some, uh, just two passages from Psalms uh, before we start worshiping. And the first one saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is with me. Bless his holy name. And then the second one saying, Behold how good and pleasant is it when brothers dwell in unity. Um, it can be kind of discouraging during these times that we don't get together, but I just want to encourage everybody to be unified in singing and in blessing our Lord um, through it.
Singing for the glory of the risen King. 
Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. God of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the passage today comes from Esther chapter 8, um, and Darren Swanson is going to preach on that for us, um, so I'm going to read from that chapter before um, we pass it off to him. Okay. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, and Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter to Esther. Esther rose and stood before the king, and she said, If it pleased the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the Agagite, the son of Ham Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus sorry, said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman and have hanged him on the gallows because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please 
with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring for an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. The king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan on the, on the 23rd day. And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews, to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces to India, uh, from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces to each province in his own script and to each person in his own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews, who were in every city, to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods on one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. A copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command. And the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a great golden crown in a robe of fine linen and purple in the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor and in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Um, I'm just gonna pray before um, Darren gets started. Dear Lord, um, just thank you so much that in the midst of everything that we're dealing with that you are pursuing us still, Lord, that you are actually still working to gather your family, um, not just in our church building again, but um, around your table. And so I just want to pray for Darren um, before we start and this message that he's going to be speaking from. And I ask God that you would um, help him to just really sense your presence as he's speaking to a camera, Lord. And um, I thank you for the longing that he um, has for you and also for his church family in the midst of this. Um, and I pray that you would give him peace, Lord, that he would be led by the Spirit, Father God. Um, and I pray that um, you would help everybody listening to um, be ready to receive all it is that you uh, want to tell us, Lord, all that you want us to interpret from this word. <laughs> and so I just, uh, again, thank you for Darren, and I pray for um, the sermon. Amen. Well, I'm hoping um, that everything is going well on everybody's screens and on their uh, laptops and computers and phones. Um, good morning. Thank you for tuning in. I know it's it can be kind of awkward and disorienting to uh, be meeting this way. It certainly is for me, I'm sitting here in, in an empty uh, gathering space. It's kind of weird. I actually had a dream like two nights ago. You're probably thinking dreams is going to be weird. No, it's not that weird. Um, well, the dream is weird, actually. I had a dream two nights ago um, that, like, we were all here. Like, the place was packed. Um, Rob was, like, putting his arm around me saying, hey, man, how you doing? Like, how, how you feeling about the sermon, man? You got, you got 28 minutes to preach, man. And I was just thinking to myself, that's really weird and arbitrary. And he's, like, all up in my grill. He's all up in my face. Like, nobody's wearing masks or anything. You know, like, all the Cars kids are, like, dancing around in a circle and then peeling off, like, to music. And I, it was really strange. So Bobby was up here saying, hey, man, you're going to play us a song on piano? It was a really weird dream, but I don't know. Maybe that means that I'm missing you guys really deeply. Um, and I certainly am. And so hopefully we can see each other again soon. Uh, anyway, with that being said, 
I do want to sort of start us off with a uh, with a question. Um, have you ever felt doomed? Have you ever felt doomed? I don't just mean scared or worried. I mean legitimately doomed. Um, some years ago, back when I was in high school, uh, I was in the uh, 11th grade. Yeah, it was 11th grade, and I got invited out to a track meet, um, KU Relays. And so it's this big national sort of event. Um, I had went the year before to, to run the mile, but this year I wasn't going, uh, at least not to run the mile. Anyway, I was going because I was, I was a backup runner for the 400-meter uh, relay, which I suck at sprinting. I'm terrible at it. Um, I was so bad that I wasn't just the backup. I was the backup backup uh, for the 400-meter for the relay. Um, but I wasn't embarrassed. You know, I was not embarrassed by at all. I actually looked at this as like a, uh, you know, get out of school card, a little mini vacation. And so, you know, I did what every, what every uh, 16-year-old would do. I stayed up till 1 a.m. playing Call of Duty, and I ate ramen noodles for dinner. Um, you know, and so, you know, I wake up in that morning. I'm headed, you know, to the school. I'm, I'm, I'm in my coach's car. Um, and it turns out that our lead sprinter does not show up. Uh, we're trying to text him. We're trying to call this dude. He ain't showing up. Turns out this dude, he, he overslept. He just straight up overslept. Um, and I was like, okay, that's a little concerning. And so then we call the other backup runner. Turns out that this guy is sick. And so I'll never forget the moment when my coach got off the phone. He turned over to me and said, so Swanson, you ready to run the 400 today? Um, I felt utterly doomed, right? The last thing that I wanted to do was go to this race where hundreds, if not thousands of people were, were sitting there watching, you know, it's being streamed on TV, and then get up here and then run this race and just bomb it. You know, I spent the whole bus ride just freaked out. Um, I feel like crap. I get there, I run the race, and yeah, I absolutely just get destroyed. I come in not last, I come in dead last. Like, I'm super far behind. It's terrible. Um, and it's that feeling that I think that many of us have had before, you know, that everything is collapsing around us. Um, we feel doomed. Um, and you feel like you, you really can't change things even if you want it to, right? I think that's what's key to a sense of, of, of doom. And, you know, in a more serious sense, I think that's what many of us feel during really hard times. You know, maybe we're, we lose our job. Maybe we are, um, you know, freaking out over the pandemic that we're in. Maybe we have just a really bad diagnosis. Maybe you find out that you have cancer or something like that and you you, you know, you can't really change that. Um, and I think that's how God's people feel here in Esther today. As a sort of, you know, recap of sorts, um, we're in chapter 8 of an Old Testament book called Esther. And so this story takes place um, when God's people are living under the Persians, right? They're living under the Persian government, um, which had a really evil and pragmatic ruler named Xerxes, um, or Ahasuerus, you know, I'll call him Xerxes, you know, he's basically that same guy in the film 300, the protagonist, yeah, it's, it's that guy. Um, and during this time, a Jewish woman named Esther, um, through a series of really ironic developments, she becomes Xerxes' wife. She becomes queen. And her uncle Mordecai is loved by the people because he helps expose a plot to assassinate Xerxes. And so Esther, her uncle, they're raised up to these, you know, they're raised up to these wonderful positions of power and influence. Um, now, if that sounds wonderful, I mean, it is, but Xerxes' right-hand man, Haman, he convinces the king, partly because of his deception, um, but partly because Xerxes doesn't even really care about the Jews, he convinces Xerxes to issue a decree or a sort of government-backed executive kind of order that allows for the killing of all of the Jews in the empire. It's insane. And, and Haman does this in part because he's, he's jealous. He's jealous of Mordecai, he, you know. And as you can imagine, 
the Jews are seriously distressed. They're doomed. But Esther, during a party, she reveals that she's Jewish. She reveals that Haman is planning on killing Mordecai and the Jews. And then Xerxes, he's at this party. He is so drunk. He is so mad that he leaves the party. Haman, he falls all over Esther, pleading for his life, right? Xerxes walks back in. He thinks that Haman is trying to assault um, Esther. And then Xerxes, he's pushed to the limit. He has, an, he has enough, right? So he has Haman executed, impaled on a stake. It's crazy. Now, I mean, it seems like that should be the end of the story, but as, you know, Kate just read, there's still a big problem. The decree is still in effect. The people are still doomed. And Esther and Mordecai are distressed, which brings us back full circle to our passage today, where we see just how Esther and Mordecai saved the Jews from a decree of death. So, you know, this morning, we, like, I think a lot of us, really, we, we often struggle to make sense of our own feelings of dread or even doom, just, just like in this passage, right? Um, and, and so this morning, I, what I want to do is I want to give us some tools. Um, I want to show how this passage gives us some tools for how to respond when calamity confronts us and feelings of doom capture us. When that happens, four things. We've got to do four things. First of all, we have to get perspective, number one. Number two, we have to look up. Number three, we have to remember the truth. And then number four, we have to rejoice in hope. Um, number one, when calamity confronts you, get perspective. Number one, when calamity confronts you, get perspective. Um, I, you know, I said earlier that if anyone had a reason to be worried or feel doomed, it was the Jews. It was the Jews here. They were facing a real calamity. We know from the rest of Scripture and from history that the Jews, they were small in number. Um, they did not have a lot of political or military sort of leverage, um, particularly underneath the Persian governance. Uh, they had barely escaped enslavement by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. Um, and up until this point, there really wasn't much that could be done to, say, to, to change the situation. They faced a real problem. You know, early in chapter 3, it tells us when, um, you know, this, this was unfolding, that the city was in confusion when they found out about this decree. Chapter 4 then says that Mordecai and the Jews, they, they, they cry out with a loud and bitter cry. And then even Esther herself, it says in chapter 4, that she is, she's distressed. She's, she's distressed. And, and, and all of those feelings are present here in chapter 8. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't think that many of us, if any, really, particularly in this church um, or even in America, have really faced the uh, prospects of our entire race being wiped out by a corrupt government. Um, but the feelings that the Jews have and their reaction to the situation does raise an important question for us today. And it's this, how, how, how do you, how do you respond to calamity? How do you respond when a sense of doom overtakes you? I want you to think about that. I, I think normally we panic, you know, I can, I can relate to that. You know, there's that scene in Chicken Little, that, that movie, that children's movie, where Chicken Little is going around um, yelling in the, in the town square, basically, ringing the, the, the city bell, saying, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, it's the end of the world as we know it. And then everybody's running around, freaking out. Um, it's, it's chaos, right? And I think many of us are like that. You know, we get loud, we get excited, we start pacing back and forth, we start sweating, and we stop making any sort of sense. And then we go further. We're, we're not content to keep the issue to ourselves because we're so convinced of the cosmic scope of the problem. So we tell everybody about it, right? Maybe, maybe you go on Facebook, right, and you start telling other people why you think things are going to be terrible, how things are, are, are over, how our lives are done for. Never mind looking at the wider circumstances. 
Never mind that we don't have all the facts. Never mind that you could actually be wrong in your assessment of the situation. Never mind that there is a God who is sovereignly in control over all things, who could subtly be working things towards an outcome that you're not even aware of. And this is how God is working in Esther chapter 8. A chapter earlier, in chapter 7, we see the ironic execution of Haman. And in our chapter this morning, we see another ironic turn of events. In verses 1, 2, and 3, we see that as was the Persian custom, King Xerxes, he decides to give the property of Haman. You know, that guy who was condemned and executed, he decides to give the property of Haman over to to the queen, to Esther. Okay, that's great, right? That, that's, that's great. But not only that, Xerxes decides to make Mordecai, the same dude who Haman spent the last few months of his life trying to get killed, he decides to set Mordecai in the same position that Haman was and make him his right-hand man in government. So now the same people who are about to die by an unjust government order, had the very same people at the highest level of government, Jews, their people, right there, sitting next to the king. So there's, there's no way you could have looked at the situation, there's no way you could have looked at the change in circumstances and said that this wasn't something good. You know, the king isn't angry anymore, Haman is dead, and they actually were in a position of power to change things. And so my first point is, when calamity confronts you and there's that feeling of dread that overwhelms you, you got to get perspective. You have to get perspective. You don't know what God might be doing. You just don't know. You got to be humble enough to admit what you don't know, but wise enough to look at what you think you know from a totally different perspective. You got to be humble enough to admit what you don't know, but wise enough to look at what you think you know from a totally different perspective. But of course, what does that practically mean, right? I can talk about that, but what does that mean? Well, here's what getting perspective doesn't mean. It does not mean spending your time trying to figure out God's hidden will and purpose for your life and suffering. It does not mean doing that. I, I think that's where many Christians are guilty. You know, we say things like, well, when God closes one door, he opens another one. Or when God closes a door, he opens a window. Um, okay, well, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't want you to walk through a door. Maybe he doesn't want you to go through a window. Maybe he just wants you to sit still. Um, we say things like, well, you know what, boo-boo, hang on, girl. Because you know what, that relationship ended bad with that one dude, but God got another man for you coming. He's going to be awesome. I'm praying it over you. I'm speaking it into existence. Like, that sounds nice, but maybe he doesn't, right? Or maybe you get married and it's a really hard marriage. Or maybe God wants you to be single the rest of your life, right? Like, we, we, just, we just don't know that. That's not what getting perspective means. It doesn't mean spending your time trying to discern God's hidden purpose for your tough situations. Getting perspective means putting yourself in a place where you are forced where you are forced to see things in a different light. That's what getting perspective means. It means putting yourself in a position so that you're forced to see things in a different light. Um, for example, so if you're single right now and you're struggling with the fact that you can't be around other people, um, that's, that's hard. Um, but you probably shouldn't just talk to other singles on the phone. Um, or on the other hand, if you're a parent and you're struggling with the fact that, you know, our kids are sometimes crazy, and you can't leave the house or go to the park, or at least some parks, um, or hang, out around, uh, hang around other people. There's no daycare. Like, okay, well, maybe you should spend time to, you know, talking to singles. Um, that might sound strange, but, but why do I say that? You know, well, singles wish they had somebody to be around them, you know, and then parents wish they could be alone for a minute. Um, they both want what the other person has. And so that tells you that the circumstances won't fix the problem because the problem is with the perspective. The problem is with the heart. 
And that's the whole point of trials, which is to get us to see who we really are. It's to show us those ways in which we struggle, we strive to have a sense of control over the situation, where we're discontent. Okay, well, you got to get perspective. That's the first thing. But what do you do when, you know, you do get perspective and things actually are as bad as they seem? Hmm, what do you do? I mean, after all, Haman dies, right? Esther and Mordecai are rewarded, but the decree of death is still in force, which means the people still need to be saved. You know, what happens when you talk to other people or you've gotten a second opinion and the situation still seems dreadful? Okay, well, secondly, you have to look up. Secondly, you have to look up. When calamity confronts you, look up. In verses 3 through 4, Esther goes to the king. She falls before him. She's weeping. She's bawling her eyes out, right? And so she's pleading with the king to not let the slaughter happen. And commentators point out that this was actually probably risky, right? Because, you know, during that time, you can't, even the queen, you, you just can't approach the king without permission. You can't approach without going through the proper channels. Um, and so commentators say that this, on Esther's part, is actually an act of faith. It's an act of faith. She's fully identifying with God's people. She's saying, hey, I am a Jew. That is my identity. And you know what? She's, she's pleading with Xerxes on their behalf. And so for the first time in the story, Esther's not really concerned with what, what might happen to her. She's not concerned with herself. You could say she's, she's looking up to God. She's acting in faith. Well, how can we apply this today? You know, I think that this passage does teach us um, or at least it could teach us about how to act faithfully, how to serve in, in, in a government, in a system that's corrupt. Um, I, I, think, I think that's legitimate, but you know, I'm, I might want to take this a different angle and say that I think that this passage teaches us, uh, particularly when we look at Esther's approach, her heart, I think that this passage teaches us something about prayer, actually. Um, you know, the idea of approaching a person with authority and power, let alone God, the King of Kings, with our hearts wide open and in total vulnerability is difficult because we're letting who we really are be examined. And that's the one thing that our culture tells us that no one is allowed to judge. But that's exactly what it means to look up to God in faith. You know, if Esther can go to a corrupt king like Xerxes and plead with him to change the situations, then how much more could we go to a righteous king of kings and plead with him to change our situation? Now, I know many of us, and not just Christians, we struggle with the idea of prayer. I mean, I think one of the common objections to prayer is that, you know, how, how do you pray to a person who's invisible? How do you pray to someone or something you can't even see, right? Um, and you know, like I said, I don't want to brush that off. I think many people have that issue. I've certainly felt that way. But I think that particular objection to Christianity and prayer is, is really just a modern objection. You know, most people throughout history have not viewed God's invisibility as a barrier to prayer. They just haven't. And even though I think it's counterintuitive, I think Scripture shows us that the most common reason authentic prayer is not that we can't see God, but that prayer is the one place where God actually sees us. And so prayer then is, is an act of faith where we look up to God and we're asking him to change things on our behalf. It, it's, it's approaching the King of Kings and abandoning any sense of self-preservation and trusting him, trusting So when calamity confronts you, you have to get perspective, first of all, and then you have to look up. You, you have to look up. You have to go to God in faith. But, of course, you know, it's not that simple. You know, what do you do when, you know, you try to act in faith? You go to God in prayer, but God, he's silent. 
you know, that's actually one of the striking things about the book of Esther. And commentators have, have pointed out that, well, you know, Esther is the one book of the Bible where we don't see God's name mentioned at all. It's strange, right? Like, on the one hand, as we read, it seems like God is at work, right? But on the other hand, God doesn't speak at all. He's totally silent. What happens when you look up in faith, like I just mentioned, and the goodness of God seems so distant, so far away, that it's hard to even grasp? You know, consider Esther's situation. The fate of the Jews is tied up in the evil and the pragmatism of an unjust ruler and system. You know, let's say things were in their favor, right? Maybe the decree can be changed, but it's Xerxes. It's Xerxes who in charge, like of, out, out of all people. And so Esther and Mordecai, they're in this situation where they have perspective, right? They, they, they are acting in faith, but Xerxes is still evil. So, so what do you do? What, what should Esther do? Well, thirdly, you have to remember the truth. Thirdly, you have to remember the truth. Let, let me explain what I, what I mean by that. In verses 5 through 8, it seems like Esther, she has this moment of clarity. And she approaches Xerxes with ingenuity, really. She says, you know, I can't appeal to Xerxes' own sense of justice to stop the situation because, you know, quite frankly, he has no sense of justice. He has no sense of morality. Um, but you know what I can do? I can appeal to him based on the fact that he loves me. Or at least he says he loves him anyways. You know, so, so she says to Xerxes, she says, look, if you really love me, if it's really true that you think I'm your number one, right? If I'm your bread and butter, then you ain't going to let this happen. There is no way you'll let me suffer. There's no way you'll let my people suffer like this. So, you know, her approach might seem kind of questionable, but is it? I mean, I don't think it is. Is she lying? No. Is she exaggerating the seriousness of the situation? No. Um, is she clever? Yes. I think she remembers the truth about Xerxes. Um, they are married. She, Xerxes says that she is beautiful. Xerxes seems to love her. Um, and so she remembers the truth. She intercedes on behalf of the Jews. And, and it's at this crucial moment that she's representing all of the Jews and whether or not they're saved depends on how well she can mediate this situation. And so as we try to sort of bring down what I just said to earth and apply it to us, um, I think it's at this point we find a clue, a fundamental clue to confronting that deep feeling of doom and dread that we so often can feel in hard situations and maybe even during this pandemic and it's this. I think that we need to remember the truth about God and who he is in relation to us. You know, unlike Xerxes, who's this corrupt ruler, God is good. The Bible over and over and over again emphasizes that fact. It emphasizes the fact that he's good and he's for us. And we need to remember that. We have friends in high places who are on our side, namely God himself. You know, Psalm 118, verses 5 through 7 say, the psalmist says, Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and he set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look and triumph on those who hate me. So ask yourself, are, are you remembering this truth? Are you reading your Bible regularly? Are you reminding yourself of the fact that God is, is on our side? If prayer is primarily a time where we talk to God, then that means reading our Bible is primarily a time where God talks to us. Some of us, I think, during this crisis actually have more free time. Um, things have changed. Um, yeah, it's so easy. It's so easy to fill our time with Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. Low key, I wish I had Disney Plus, um, but I'm just, you know, stuck with Netflix. Like, there's nothing wrong with watching movies and enjoying yourself. But if you can remember the storyline of Tiger King and Avengers Endgame more 
clearly, then you can remember the storyline of Scripture, then there's a problem. You're never going to have your bearings. You're never going to have balance. You're never going to have perspective. You're always going to be thrown around. You're never going to be able to deal with calamity. So you have to get perspective. You have to look up. And then thirdly, like I just mentioned, you have to remember the truth. You have to remember the truth. Of course, there is one more issue. Um, what do you do when you've gone to God, who, unlike Xerxes, I've mentioned before, he, he's, God is totally just, God is totally morally perfect. There's nothing, there's no error, there's no sin, there's nothing imperfect about him. What do you do when that God, he breaks forth from his silence, and the answer to your situation is no? You want things to change? And God says, no. What do you do in that moment, right? Like, like God is king. He's not obligated to say yes to every single one of our prayers. Like, like you can't turn a king into a genie. And at a human level, I think that's the dilemma that we see in verses 7 through 8 here. You know, some people read Xerxes one way, but I think most uh, people that I've read are scholars they're saying that Xerxes' response here in verses 7 through 8 are, are actually one of just, not desperation, but what's the word I'm looking for? It's one of just being sort of fed up, being tired. Um, you know, he still doesn't care about the Jews. He's still not really concerned about their fate. He's kind of just like, Ugh, I, wish, I just want to get this issue off of my back. He really hasn't changed much throughout this whole story. Xerxes says, look, Look, y'all, I, I got rid of Haman. I gave you all of his stuff, right? And then I, I went ahead and made your uncle, my right-hand dude, like, who, by the way, is a Jew. Thank you for that, by the way, Esther. You know what? Take the signet ring and minister how you want to, but I'm not going to change the decree. I can't change it. I won't change it. You know? What's love got to do with it? You know? It's not that Xerxes doesn't love Esther. It's that the decree can't be changed. And there's some things in life that are just like that, you know. And, and I think that's hard for our culture to grasp because we're so obsessed with trying to reverse the irreversible or unsee what can't be unseen. And that's especially true when we, you know, when we talk about death and suffering. And I think that's what makes our current time so disoriented. So disorienting. You know, maybe you try to ignore the reality of suffering by, you know, just spending all your time playing video games, watching YouTube videos, or maybe even worse, you're watching explicit videos on the internet or explicit movies. Or maybe you just openly, just outright deny that things aren't that bad. You say, you know what, maybe the sky is falling, maybe things are kind of crazy, maybe I'm not sure what's going on, but, but you know what, it's not that bad. Don't worry about it. Maybe your response mechanism to, to terrible situations is just denial, just denying that it's even a problem. Maybe you're the person who, at the end of the day, who doesn't like to go to funerals because you're so terrified at seeing that person in an open casket, knowing that you, one day, are going to be there. But we can't escape death and suffering. And it does no good to deny it. It does no good to deny those realities because God has actually decreed death and suffering in response to sinfulness and evil of mankind. Let me say that again. God has actually decreed death and suffering in response to the sinfulness of evil to the sinfulness of mankind and the evil that we see. Unlike Xerxes, who, who is evil, God has justly decreed death and suffering in response to our willful rebellion of him. And Genesis 3 shows us this. You know, Adam and Eve, they refused to listen to God. They refused to take, you know, his word. You know, Adam and Eve, they choose over life. And since then, everybody has been following in their footsteps. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're religious or not. 
It doesn't matter if you're raised in the church or if you're raised in the streets. It doesn't matter if you grew up in Beverly Hills or if you grew up in East St. Louis. We're all under God's just decree of death. So scripture says the wages or, or the payout for our sin is death. And, and the thing that gives death its sting, the thing that makes death so painful and hard is eternal suffering. That's what God has decreed. And so I, I know, I, I know this is hard to process. But consider this. If God, the author of life, and the author of peace, if he is who he is, and sinning is willingly separating ourselves from him, willingly separating ourselves from the author of life and peace, doesn't it make sense that sin produces death and suffering? I mean, can you have the author of life? Can you have life, rather, without the author of life? I mean, can a person breathe without oxygen? Can a person hear without ears? You know, most of us have been told that we're, we're good people. We, we, you know, maybe we've done some bad things, but certainly not anything that's sinned, or certainly not anything that's worthy of death. But hear me, sin is just not, sin is more robust than what you think. Sin, sin is not just doing what you shouldn't do. Sin is, is failing to do what you should do. Sin is not just doing what you shouldn't do. Sin is failing to do what you should do. And oftentimes, this looks like indifference. It looks like indifference. Elie uh, Wiesel, he's a survivor of the Holocaust, and so in 1999, he gives a speech at the White House um, called The Perils of Indifference. And he says that the reason why so many Jews suffered was not just that Hitler was, you know, evil, um, a dictator, he, and he certainly was, it's, but it's not just because of that. It's because people, even the Germans, even some of the Germans anyway, and even many Americans, yes, even the president, FDR himself, ignored what they did know, and they failed to help when they should have. He talks about how the government, you know, was met with a ship full of Jewish people, about a thousand Jewish people, and they actually sent them away right back to Germany. Weasel says, and I quote, um, it's not on the screen, so just, just follow along carefully here with me. Weasel says, it is so much easier to avoid interruptions to our work, our dreams, our hope, our hopes. Yet for the person who is indifferent, his or her neighbors are of no consequence, and therefore their lives are meaningless. Indifference is not a response. Indifference is not a beginning. It is an end. Therefore, indifference is always the friend of the enemy because it benefits the aggressor, never the victim, whose pain is magnified when he or she feels forgotten. Wow. So every time, you know, you've thought during this pandemic, man, this pandemic is so frustrating. It's so annoying. I just wish I could go out with my friends. Like, man, I don't care about this virus. Like, I'm young, man. I'm healthy. It doesn't bother me. You know what? Plane tickets are cheap. I'm going to go ahead and have my spring break because nothing's stopping me. Or if you just complain and said, man, this is so inconvenient. Like, all my summer plans are ruined. Or every time you've, you've went out carelessly and you don't even care, you're not even acting as though there are elderly image bearers of God who could actually suffer because of your careless actions. Every time you've done that, you're committing the sin of indifference. It's indifference. And I've been there too, right? Like, like maybe I don't need to go to the grocery store five times just because I need the right type of seasoning for my barbecue. Like, maybe I just don't need to do that. Maybe I, I shouldn't be complaining like, my first thought when, when the government says, well, you can't go out, is, should not be, man, my plans. I should say, man, those people are, those people are at risk. Though, there are elderly people in my neighborhood who are at risk. I shouldn't be indifferent. And this is what God's just decree of death is in response to. But the good news is that there's hope. There's hope. 
you know, when calamity confronts us, when it confronts me, you, it's not just that we should get perspective. It's not just that we should look up. It's, you know, we're not just remembering the truth, but we also are rejoicing in hope. When calamity confronts you, rejoice in hope. And we see this last portion of scripture in verses 9 through 17, showing us, illustrating how the Jews are saved. You know, things seem hopeless, right? But in another ironic turn of events, Mordecai realizes, he he realizes he could actually write another decree, a counter decree. He, He couldn't avoid the first. He couldn't change that. But he could write another decree that allowed for the Jews to defend themselves and to fight back. And so he makes it almost phrase for phrase, and it practically nullifies the first decree. The first one allows for for anybody, really, within the Persian government to attack, to kill, to plunder. And then Mordecai writes a second decree, and it's almost word for word, saying that the Jews can fight back. And the essence of this whole thing is self-defense. It's fighting back in a time of war and calamity. And so don't get too caught up over whether or not it's moral that the Jews are able to do this. You know, Jeff Carson's preaching next week, and he's going to tackle that a little bit more in depth. But the essence of it is self-defense which I'm sure we can all understand. And when the Jews hear this, they're blown away with joy because now they have a chance. Now they can actually live. And verse 15 goes on to tell us that Mordecai, he goes through the city and when he sees that, and when the people, when they, when they see that there's a Jew who issued a decree, when it's a Jew who did that, and he's in the highest position of government, they had no doubt in their mind that things were going to work out for their good. Things are so strongly in their favor that even people who weren't Jewish claim to be Jews. It's incredible, right? Brothers and sisters, I want us to consider what this means for us today, though. If God has issued a decree of death of suffer- and, and suffering because of our sin, like I just mentioned a minute ago, what is our hope? Let me just take us a step back. I just described, you know, we need, to, we need to get perspective. We need to look up. We need to remember the truth. And fourthly, we need to rejoice in hope. I described how Genesis 3, God's decree of death, but passages like Isaiah 11, Isaiah, 55, Isaiah 53 show God's decree of salvation, a promise that God has made to send a Savior. Jesus is that person. That's exactly what we see in the New Testament. On the cross, Jesus is taking on that same decree of death that you and I both deserve. He's placing it on himself, like Galatians 3 says. He's taking on the curse. And so now when we trust in Jesus Christ, we go free. We go free. The decree, the curse is lifted up from us. No doom, only eternal joy, only eternal satisfaction. All of our eternal suffering is erased. That sting of death, no more. And that's what the Bible calls the gospel. That's what we call the gospel. That's what we believe. That's what we cherish. That's what we hold on to. That's what we mean when we say good news, right? It's good news that while we were dead in our sins, Christ died at the right time for the ungodly and saved and saved us from a perfectly just decree of death. And suffering. It's good news that there's coming a time when death itself will be defeated. It's good news that there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Jesus Christ. Is that you? Is that you? Friends, whether this pandemic and social distancing lasts another month or a year, we still can't change our ultimate and cosmic circumstances. Whether, you know, you have tons of issues weighing over you and you feel doomed. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's, you know, job. You still can't change your ultimate circumstances. You know, maybe we find a vaccine for COVID-19 and people get healed. You know what? We're still going to die one day. All of us. But the gospel and the main point of my sermon is that you and I, we can rejoice because we have been saved from God's just decree of death and suffering through Jesus Christ. We've been saved from ultimate calamity and doom. If you really believe this, is there really, is there really anything that can take away your joy, that can make you run around like a chicken with his head cut off, screaming that the sky is falling, we're all doomed, it's the end of the world as we know it? 
I don't think so. I, I don't think so. But it gets even better. It gets even better. When Jesus comes to save us, he's actually going to reverse every evil, every ounce of suffering or sin, and turn it in on its head and use it for our ultimate good and glory in heaven one day. We will ultimately see God face to face and gain that perspective. That is so hard to see during trials, right? And one day we are going to look up and see God's goodness, and we're not going to doubt at all for the slightest moment that God is good and that he's for us and he wants to bless us and he's, and he's with us. And one day we will look up and we will see Jesus as our mediator standing right next to God the Father on our behalf. And we'll know that we're loved. But in the meantime, we find ourselves in the beauty between and so we have to get perspective, we have to look up, we have to remember the truth, and rejoice in hope. You know, as I close here, I just want to speak for, for about a minute, maybe, to you. If you're listening and you're not a believer, um, you, don't, you can't cognitively, or, or with your heart even, say that you recognize Jesus as King. Then I want to invite you this morning to come to Him to give your life to him, escape condemnation and death, come to Christ, commit your life to him. And when you do so, don't hide who you are, right? Don't hide who you are. Identify with God's people. Join, join a healthy local church, get baptized, commit to his people, come and have Christ redeem you from the effects of the fall. And if you are a Christian, I just want to challenge you. I want to challenge us to seriously spread this good news, right? Like fill your Facebook feed, fill your Instagram with the message of the gospel, with the good news. Because you know what? Christ, not the government, certainly not COVID-19 and not your circumstances, whether it be sickness, death, or any type of other suffering, Christ, he's in control. So let's believe that this morning, Karis. Um, let's hold to that. Let's rejoice. Let me pray for us. Um, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for technology. Obviously, it's not always reliable, but you know what? At the end of the day, um, we're able to communicate your word to people, and I'm excited about that. I'm happy with that. Lord, may, I, I pray that you would be pleased with the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart. I pray that you would be um, working in our hearts. God, I know that uh, maybe some of us feel tired of just talking about coronavirus and, you know, but I think, I think it needs to be said. I think it needs to be talked about because so often we can do what I described earlier. We can sort of push away the reality of suffering. And I think some of our tiredness of talking about that can be just sort of wanting to ignore it. And maybe we're not grasping with it. Maybe we are, but maybe not. And so I just pray that, you know, people would, would have been blessed by that. Um, i I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd give us joy that no one can take away from us like you describe in uh, the gospel according to John, that we would have joy that's steady, that's sure, um, that's everlasting. Um, and lastly, Lord, I just pray for our missionaries, um, particularly in places like Japan and Brazil. It can be really hard there. Um, and so I just pray for the Glossons um, and the groves, that you would lift them up. I pray for missionaries in North Africa, that you would sustain them in this time where they obviously can feel so isolated. Um, and for everybody in Brazil, the Paps, the Stills, that you would bless them and that you would keep them safe. Um, thank you for your word. It's in your name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to read from a passage in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. If you guys would read the underlined portions on the screen. Um, so to keep me from become, becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, I think that during this time, it's for a, easy for us to have thoughts about failure. And I fail um, in loving my family well. I fail in not being afraid during this pandemic and even failing in patience and spending time in God's word. Um, and so just this verse is encouraging because Paul even pleaded with the Lord with the sufferings that Darren had mentioned that God has actually decreed um, that when he asks God to take them away, God's response isn't even a yes or no. It's, it's my grace is sufficient for you. And he's actually asking us to boast in those weaknesses because now we're setting the stage for God's strength to be made complete through us. And so I just want to encourage you guys throughout the week, whenever you feel like you're failing during this pandemic um, in this season, um, boast in those weaknesses so that God can take over and, and uh, be the center of glory and strength. Um, if you would join me for one more song today. <laughs>
so much that you are our sufficient father god and um that because you are in control that we we don't have to be afraid lord um and it's so it's such a thing to rejoice about god that it's you that we get to worship and praise that it's a god with your heart and character and um i pray that you would help us to just be encouraged by darren's words today lord and that we would be intentional with spending time with you um in the Bible and in prayer and in the way that we interact with others, Lord, and whether it be over the phone or our family. Um, and God, I pray that you would help us to know just that you get so excited when we come and uh, do those things, Lord, when we come and read our Bible and pray, Lord. And even though we do them so imperfectly, Lord, um, help us to just be reminded that you love us and um, that we would just pursue you back. In your son's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> 